the moment you say to a kid, I was listening to this podcast today, <laughs> they already know, oh God, oh no. oh no, what the heck have you been listening to? So I don't even want to do that. Yeah. I want to connect with them in a very authentic way without making it about me, but showing how we relate. Let me give you an example. Here's a bad example. Bad example is, wow, times have changed so much since I was your age. I can't even imagine what you're going through. So let's talk about that. That's horrific. Here's why. The kid is listening going, yeah, you have no clue what I'm going through. You just admitted it. So why am I listening to you? So that's a really bad example. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 164. Today, we're talking about sex with Mike Domich. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have a strong, connected relationship with their child. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting course, and I'm the author of the upcoming new book, Raising Good Humans. Welcome back, dear listener, or welcome if this is your first time listening. I'm so happy to be here in your ears, whether you are doing your laundry going for a walk or driving your car, whatever you're doing. Thank you for inviting me into your headspace. (laughs) I really believe in the power of our time and the power of our time to really tap into what's most important to us. And this is going to be an incredibly powerful episode. In just a moment, I'm going to be sitting down with Mike Domich, and he's the founder and executive director of the Date Safe Project, the nation's leading organization for creating healthier dating environments and raising awareness on issues around sexual assault. Now, you may hear that and say, I have young kids. This is not an episode for me. You are going to be surprised. Actually, this is a really a power, powerful, powerful episode for everybody. This conversation and Mike and his work are so, so important because it's going to really make you think that he... I heard Mike speak live and I was so impressed with him and his power and he is going to start to change the way you think about things, which is really, really powerful. So some of these questions, right? Like, is the way you're raising your really young child, right? Is the way you're raising your child empowering them or disempowering them to have healthy boundaries about their body, right? When should we start to talk to children about dating? When should you be teaching them things that we were never taught, right? So there's a lot of powerful questions here. And he'll challenge the way you think about consent and leave you talking about this episode for a while afterwards. I promise you that. So some of the things I really particularly want you to listen to for are some of these powerful takeaways that I've gotten. Like So he, Mike, challenges us with one of with some of his ideas. So like he's saying that parents are actually one of the greatest violators of children's healthy boundaries. Hmm, right? How does this happen? It's really you can see how this happens. He tells us what not to say when talking to your child about dating. And he lets us know that the conversation that we most fear to have is the one that we most need to have. Oh my goodness. This is a really, really fascinating episode, my friends. So I cannot wait for you to dive in. Right just before we do, I want to give you a quick message letting you know that in just a couple of weeks, I will be running the my Unmartyr Yourself Challenge. And this is for you if you find that you get into that mommy martyr mindset, right? Do you put yourself last? Do you feel guilty for self-care? And I'm going to be doing a free live training from May 6th through 9th where you're going to learn to make time for yourself, really speak your truth, but skillfully, not in ways that push away others, right? Or your partner, whatever. You're going to learn to destroy your mommy guilt and improve your relationships and thrive without ever being feeling selfish, right? So I love doing the Unmartyr Yourself Challenge. It's a a fabulous week. So I hope you'll join me. 
That is at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. That's mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. So I hope you will join me for that. All right, now, please join me at the table as I talk to Mike Domich. So Mike Domich, am I saying your last name? Your last name is hard to pronounce. Am I saying it right? Well, yes. well the good news <laughs> is if you don't look at it, it's super easy to pronounce. Just say Domish. Uh, but, uh, but if you look at it, yeah, it's, a, it, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you get confused. I'm so happy to have you on. I really love and respect your story. And I was riveted by hearing you speak at Todd and Kathy Adams' conference. It was wonderful. And it really made me think and really made me want to... I was like, oh my gosh, like my daughter is going into sixth grade. I like need to get Mike to my daughter's school and have him talk to them. This is amazing. But you know, you talk about your work is with the Date Safe Project and you wrote the Can I Kiss You book and you talk about consent, which I mean, it's not like the first thing I would be super riveted about, li- like thinking about and listening to, you know, but your story of how you got into this work is really deeply, really deeply personal. And I was wondering if you would, you would share that here for the listener here in the Mindful Mama podcast. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Hunter, I, this is not something you grew up thinking, oh, I'm going to be a speaker on <laughs> consent and sexual assault, <laughs> especially in the 80s. That's when I was growing up, 70s and 80s. Nobody was talking about this. So that was not my intention. I was a college student in Chicago, actually, at the time when I received a phone call from my mom. Now, I grew up in a very close family. It was I was the youngest. I had three older sisters, Vicki, Rita, and Sherry. And Sherry was four years older than me. And I received a phone call from my mom informing me that Sherry had been raped. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was a sophomore in college. I was distraught. I was furious. I was angry. I was confused. I was hurt. And that would continue for months. That's not something that just goes away after a few days or after a few weeks. I would transfer back home. I'd leave the college I loved because I wanted to be close to home during the trial. He was caught, the the predator. And all of this happened. And then the next year, I was an athlete at this campus that I transferred to. and We had to go see a speaker. And the speaker spoke about sexual assaults. And I sat there and went, oh, my gosh, I could use my voice to do something about this. And then in 1990, 91, I started speaking out. I worked in college classrooms at the college I was at. I'd speak in local high schools. And that's where it all began back then. And hard to believe it's now 28 years later. Yeah, yeah. And now imagine some some of the listeners are like, well, okay, that's really interesting for college students or for young adults. I have a (laughs) five-year-old. What does this have to do with me? But the way you describe it. You talk about culture change that really starts at like the youngest ages. So what are the things that are happening now that are leading to to some of the problems and, and how can we look at these differently? Yeah. Let's give the parents out there some classic examples. Let's say that you have a child in pre-K kindergarten and they're going somewhere to school every day. Uh, even in those grades, they can start to hear about so-and-so like so-and-so and so-and-so sitting next to so That's starting in first grade. Oh my God, that's true. Actually, I used to hold hands with John John Almeida during nap time in kindergarten. I still remember. Right, <laughs> right, right. And we all have that memory of that first crush or those kind of feelings. And, and yeah, they're natural. We don't want anybody to think that there's anything wrong with having those feelings as a child, but you start to formulate what it means to have boundaries, to like someone, to express how you like someone at those young ages. And so parents need to teach respect of boundaries at those young ages. The biggest mistakes parents make is loving parents who say, well, it's just so innocent. Isn't it just so cute and innocent? And so because they believe that in their mind, they don't think they need to teach about it. Like, what does it mean to have boundaries at this age? And kids can quickly breach those boundaries inappropriately, whether knowingly or not, they can do that. And it doesn't excuse it because they don't know. When you do harm to another kid's child, I mean, imagine if your child, the one whose boundaries are being breached, your your parents probably not going to be sitting there going, well, it's okay because they didn't know better. You're going to be like, no, we need to teach boundaries. That's not okay. Somebody did that to them. Yeah. Uh, And so the younger you teach it, the better. Now, the irony is parents are one of the greatest violators Mm. of boundaries. And that's the irony here. Like I can walk up to parents and say, 
middle school height parents, fifth grade parents and say, hey, before anybody ever touched your kid, when they get to an age that it's appropriate to be intimate, whether it's kissing or something more advanced, do you hope your child's given a choice and the choice is respected? Every parent says, of course. Yeah. Of course I want that for my child. Say, great. Do you give yourself, your child, a true choice on whether they can give you a hug or a kiss goodnight? Mm. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Well, do you give them a choice? Do you just kiss them goodnight? Or do you actually say, may I have a kiss goodnight? And they're like, well, I love them. I don't need to do that. I'm the parent. I have the right to do that. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I just, you just told me you want them to always have their boundaries respected. Why would you, the one who loves them, so quickly violate them? Yeah. And teach them that if I love you, you owe this to me. And if a child learns at a young age that non-sexual intimacy, I owe it to you. Well, when they get into sexual intimacy, they're going to think I owe that to you if I love you. So if you say things like you love me, that's why you should do this with me. I will subconsciously believe that because I learned that at a young age that if I loved you, I'd show some form of intimacy. Now we're at a stage where I think it's sexual intimacy. So we want to break that, that, that history we have of our culture of teaching children, they give up their boundaries when they love someone. We want to break that and that cycle so that our kids can feel empowered to declare their boundaries and know it's okay to say, no, mom, no, dad, I don't want to hug right now. I don't want to kiss right now. Because if they can learn to say that to you, how much easier is it going to be to say it to a partner down the road? Yeah. Yeah. If they can always say that's not okay. I mean, the classic example of this is like, I remember having to give my grandfather a hug or give my grandfather a kiss and just like, oh, like I just hate, like, I love my grandpa. (laughs) He's still alive. Grandpa, I love you. You know, but, but yeah, as a young kid, I just being forced to do anything like that, just, oh, it just. Yeah. It's totally the creepy factor. Right, The kids feel that. They know it. They have an instinct that says this isn't right. And you see them almost peel back like, okay, it's like the hug's not real. It's they not- turn limp. <laughs> yeah. And I made the same mistake. I mean, my kids are older now. My kids are out of high school. They're, they're even out of college, some of them. But I remember the first one when they were young, I made no mistake. I'd be like, go give grandma a hug. And it was my mom who taught me this. When one of them must have sort of pulled back a little bit, I don't remember what happened, but she said, Uh, well, Mike, I don't want them to give me a hug if they don't want to give me a hug. And I was like, Oh Oh. man, I should have known better of all people. I should know better. Yeah. Why would anybody want a hug? That's not sincere and authentic. That that's not sharing loving intimacy. There's nothing about that. That's loving. And it was a great wake up call for me going, wow, if, if I'm falling for this and this is years, years ago now, maybe 20 years ago now, but And I'm teaching consent in relationships. Wow, even how subtly all of us can fall into this trap. Do you put yourself last? Do you feel guilty for taking care of yourself or going to the gym or making time for meditation? It's time to let go of this harmful mommy martyr mindset. It's time to reclaim your time, your sanity, and the energy that you bring to the world and your family. I'm so excited to let you know that I'm offering a free live training called the Unmartyr Yourself Challenge. And over four days, you're going to learn to make time for yourself, speak your truth skillfully, destroy mommy guilt, and improve your relationships and thrive without ever being selfish. So I hope you'll join us. It's at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. That's mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr, U-N-M-A-R-T-Y-R. As soon as you sign up, you'll get instant access to the Unmartyr Yourself self-care assessment. It's a powerful, eye-opening exercise where you'll assess your physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and relationship needs. Join the Unmartyr Yourself Challenge now at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. I can't wait to see you there. So if I'm the parent of a five-year-old and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like how, how far do we go back about this? Like we will obviously want to teach them that they, their body is their own and all those things. Like, but you know, say you have 
a pre-verbal child, you know, would you, would you say like, Hey, can I, can I give you a kiss? Good night. You know, that kind of like, what would you say to that? I'm just curious. Yeah. So let's say that the key thing here is that when they're able to communicate, right, because they're not able to, and you do want to show love and affection, that's yeah. part of showing connection and gaining connection to a child as an infant, as a baby, right? Those kind of situations, you want that loving intimacy. When they have the ability to communicate, when they know, when they have a sense of their, their learning, their, their space and their boundaries, then yeah, you do want to be able to say, can I give you a hug? Can I give you a kiss? Because the earlier, the easier it is, right? If it's just the norm that this is the way I grew up, well, then this is the way I deserve to be treated is just the norm. Mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. it's much harder, for, like I said, I learned it later than I had hoped to learn it as a parent. Mm-hmm. And then you got to backwards your, your education or what you've done. That's tougher. Uh, when I get parents who say, well, my kids are already 13 or 14. All right, you still got to reverse the, the lesson. You don't keep going with bad lessons just because they're 13 or they're 14. Mm-hmm. You got to reverse the lesson. That's harder to do. You still need to do, but it's harder to do. So the younger you do it, the more natural it becomes. I bet your kids grew up having so many uncomfortable conversations with <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, they were sitting here. I used to always say that if your kids know that you're willing to get uncomfortable, it's the greatest sign of a loving parent. Oh. It doesn't mean you treasure them being uncomfortable. You look forward to them. No, it's that you are willing to be uncomfortable as a parent to teach them the lessons that are so valuable. Because people say to me, well, what about, their, kids will react different ways. Like somebody comes to you and say, well, this was easy. Our, it was easy with our child or whatever. I'm like, oh, you just haven't had enough kids then. Because it's just not, <laughs> it's not always going to be easy. There's no golden ticket out there. No child's perfect. No parent's perfect. We have four sons, each their own individual. So is it possible that when one was younger, he'd cover his ears and go, I'm not listening to this. I'm not listening to this. Awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other one would just go, how much time is this going to take? And you'd be like, oh, 15, 20 minutes. Can we just do it now? Okay. I mean, just total opposites, Mm -hmm. right? But they knew that you weren't going to give up on them. That Mm -hmm. yes, I'm willing to be uncomfortable because that's how much I love you. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to intentionally try to make you uncomfortable, but I am not even a but. I am committed to giving you knowledge you need to best make the safest choices for yourself and others. And so we're going to have these conversations. Mm, mm, yeah. And you teach. I remember when you spoke at the conference, I remember feeling like you pushed some sort of like boundaries or people felt like, what? Wait a second, Mike Domish, what are you saying? Because you teach, and the, the title of your book is, Can I Kiss You? You teach consent at all levels. Can you talk to us a little more about this and why this is so important? Yeah. So here we are in today's society. And everybody's talking about yes means yes. Prior to yes means yes, yes, everybody was saying no means no. No means no. I was always saying no means no is messed up. And everybody's going, well, you must love yes means yes. Nope, I don't. They're like, well, why not? Here's the problem with both. When the world was preaching no means no, who was that putting all the responsibility on? The one who's reticent to, usually the woman, right? Or the, 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 the party is- that's reticent to... Yeah. yeah, the person is being done to. Yeah. yeah. If I don't say no, oh, they have a green light. That's the impression that no means no. So if you don't get a no, which is really messed up. So if I just do things to you, if you don't say no, I can do whatever I want to you. I mean, think about how messed up that is. Oh, God, There's no so choice in that. It's a defense system, right? If you don't defend me, then I have the right to go, which is, that's not a choice. That, that you're not getting a choice in that. So then when we went, oh, yes means yes still was based on your response, nothing I did. So we have this message of yes means yes or no means no to a question no one's asking. No one. Nobody taught them how to ask for what they want sexually or don't want sexually. Uh, and so we have this no means no to yes means yes to, the, to a question no one's asking. So, the, so what happens is kids hear that and go, well, they didn't say no. So even in the world of yes means yes, they don't think they have to ask. Because the yes in their mind is, they didn't push me away. They didn't say no. So I got a yes. Mm. Right? And so what we have to flip the switch, the whole script, I mean, we have to flip it and say, wait, how do we teach this in a way that the person who's the assertive one, the sexually assertive one, making the move 
has language that they have to be responsible for before they make the move so that we don't have to defend ourselves from this person, that I actually am given a clear-cut choice beforehand. And so the message should still be three words, but it's not no means no, it's not means yes means yes. The messaging should be, do you ask? That puts it on me. Before I do something to you, did I ask? Right? And if you, now here's where you get the pushback, which is referred to people like, whoa, 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 I'm married. Are you saying I need to ask? Whoa, 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 I've been with this person for six months. You're saying I need to ask? Whoa, 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 do I have to ask every time? Common one I'll get from high scores. Whoa, 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 do you ask your partner all the time? You'll get all this kind of stuff. And it's immediate pushback at the simple idea of asking your partner what they want to do. Yeah. Which shouldn't be groundbreaking. I guess not. I guess not. But what about, I mean, I guess playing the devil's well, advocate. Well, people let's play like, devil's advocate because people about? can't see your face right now, which I love. But I can because we're doing this via video. And you <laughs> even have the face of, well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because what about, people say, what about body language, right? Like we communicate so much. Like you're seeing my face, right? You're seeing yeah. my face is communicating. <laughs> like what about all those communication? I mean, like if I think about that with my husband, like there's just like a lot of communication that's already happened that we just, ex- like that doesn't happen verbally, of course. Okay, let's go there. Okay. I love this question because <laughs> I get it all the time. It's one of my favorite questions, which is, can't I tell from body language? Yes. Here's all that body language can do. It can give you a signal. It cannot give you the answer. Mm. So the signal is, I'm into you. The signal is, uh, I want to do something with you. What? Mm. The body language doesn't answer that. It just says, I'm into you or I'm into this happening. What's this? If you're married, anyone listening who's married or has been married or in a long-term relationship, doesn't even need marriage, or in a sexually advanced relationship, knows that what you wanted on Tuesday might be different than what you wanted on Wednesday. So you give me the exact same look both nights because you're equally horny both nights. Yeah. But you don't want the same thing. So how do I know? I guess they're just so uncomfortable with like sort of saying these words and things like that. Like I just, it seems like it's just maybe, I don't know, maybe it's, it's our puritanical roots. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but well, it that's just it. like it's so hard for us to just say, talk, like say, say those words. It like make, it makes my cheeks pucker because I feel like I swallowed a lemon. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're getting a little red right now. Yes, exactly. So, but that, here's the great thing about seeing that is, you're able to right now in your mind say to yourself, wait a second, Hunter, why am I getting uncomfortable? You mentioned your partner, so you're married. So why would it in any way phase me to look my partner in the eye and tell him exactly what I want to do sexually? (laughs) Why would that phase me? Unless society has taught me there's something wrong with that. Mm. And society does teach there's something wrong with that, especially for somebody who identifies as a woman to own her sexual voice and say, hey, how would you like to blank, blank, blank right now? (laughs) Now, the irony of that is women will hear that and say to me, whoa, they're going to think I'm a slut. They're going to think I'm a this. They're going to think I'm a that, right? Partners of women will say, I'd freaking love that. Are you kidding? (laughs) That'd be like the greatest thing ever. I would, that's, that's such a hot turn on. Oh my gosh. And when you're in front of audiences, I'm in front of a thousand or 5,000. The response from partners is, oh my gosh, yes. Can we have more of that? Cut out the games. Cut out that I'm supposed to know what you want. Just tell me. It's a turn on. It's sexy. But culture has said, don't own your voice. There's, there's something deviant about owning your voice. And this leads us all the way back to our kids thinking, I don't have the right to declare my boundaries. Mm. Right? It all starts at a young age. I'm not supposed to declare my boundaries. And so then as you get older, I'm not supposed to declare what I like either. I'm not supposed to talk about this stuff. The more we talk about things, the less, I'm sorry, the less we talk, the less we teach to talk about sexual intimacy, the more shame we build around it. And shame loves to thrive in the dark. It loves to thrive where no one's talking. So do you want to raise your kids in in a culture of shame and sex or in a culture that says sex should be this wonderful gift that is mutually experienced, and that's key language, that is mutually experienced with partners 
And for that to happen, it takes a lot to happen right. And that's the part parents freak out about. They go, well, wait, if I teach sex as this great gift, then my kids are going to be incentivized to have sex before they should. Not if you only, if you only say that, like sex is a great thing, you got to go try it. If you only say that, yeah, you might totally mislead your child. Absolutely. into trying something before they're ready. Mm-hmm. But if you give them a full comprehensive education, now they have all the information to use when they're in those moments to realize I'm not ready because I do want it to be so amazing for all partners, for this to be mutual and wonderful. And because of all the knowledge I have in my head, I know that we're not at that place right now. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I need to slow down. And that's what happens when you give kids knowledge, they want to do the right thing. When we don't give them knowledge, they still want to do the right thing, but they don't know what it is. So they go with what their gut's telling them. They go with the flow or they go with the pressure from the partner right? Because nobody taught me whether this feels right or wrong. And they're saying this is going to feel good. Then I do with them and it didn't feel so good, by the way. Well, now this is messed up. I thought this was supposed to be like fireworks. Nobody taught me this can go wrong. So parents Mm want to be able to teach. I call it the stairway to mutually amazing intimacy. And imagine that you had a stairway that every step was so wide that you couldn't skip a step. Like Mm -hmm. if you skipped, you'd fall, you'd trip. And if, if the stairwell was missing a step, you'd fall through the stairway and you'd fall down. What, and this is a great question to ask your kids. What do you think are the essential steps on that stairway to mutual amazing intimacy? Oh, that must be present for this to be a mutually amazing intimate experience. Ask your kids, what do you think the steps would be? Yeah, what would be on that stairway? Uh-huh. You're going to come up with, if you, if, and you can add to it, but you want them to talk first. You want them to, because you want to see how they view it, right? And they'll be like, well, what do you mean? Well, maybe start them out with, okay, do you think that you're going to have way better intimacy if you f- feel you can trust your partner in that moment? Because intimacy is vulnerable. You're exposed. Mm-hmm. They're exposed. Do you feel that trust would help? Yeah. Do you think it would be essential for you to really be able to let go? Because mm-hmm. to really have amazing intimacy, you want to be able to let go and be present and not worry at all. Do you think tr- they, they might say, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. there's one of our steps. Do you think knowledge is going to be key? Like if you two are just trying something, but you have no knowledge of how to make it feel good, that you could, it could still be a disaster even though you're trying to do everything right. Oh, I guess so. I didn't think of that. I mean, can I mean, how much of that? Oh, it can be a disaster here. And you can teach them <laughs> all the ways it can be a disaster. So they're not aware of that maybe. So now you get to teach them. Say, so, yeah, knowledge is critical. Do you, how much knowledge do you have about what it takes to feel good sexually for you and your partner? Mm. And suddenly you're like, whoa, I don't have that kind of knowledge. I, and porn doesn't count because yeah. porn's a show. It's mm-hmm. not two people expressing this amazing intimacy with each other, it's for show. And porn performers admit that. They say it's for visual and audio fantasy. So that's not an educational resource. And it doesn't mean that, I know some parents who said, well, I've seen porn that helped me understand. Yeah, but you add a context to put it into. Without context, it can be even more dangerous than it can be without context. So you want to put- Creating a context. Oh, yeah. It's so important. And that's a whole nother discussion, porn, which we can get into if you want to. Whole nother discussion. So now you start to think what's on the stairway. What gets interesting is the more you dive into this, the more the parent starts to recognize where they are needing some remodeling of their own stairway. Yeah, where, where we might be missing some steps. What are some of the places where we parents see that? All right. So a common one is in feeling safe feeling safe? Really? Yeah, because, yeah. yeah. Well, what people think is, well, I feel safe because I use a condom. Okay, well, that's Mm -hmm. physical safety. That's good that you don't ever feel threatened by your partner. By the way, some people can't say that. Yeah. Some people do feel threatened at times in sex with their partner. Mm -hmm. What about emotional safety? Mm -hmm. And like, what do you mean? Well, are you thinking about your body and parts you don't like during sex? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, well, of course I do. Well, then you're not feeling completely safe because you're thinking about things that are taking you out of the moment because you think you're being judged. Either you're judging it or you think they're going to judge it. 
Mm-hmm. So I'll say to parents, uh, have you asked your partner, hey, you know, I don't like this thing about my, does that bother you during sex? Almost never does the part that you think bothers somebody, they don't even care about that to <laughs> any degree whatsoever during sexual intimacy. So it allows you to free yourself of this concern and to feel more safe, more vulnerable in a wonderful way. And going, I mean, without being too graphic, people can fear some, their geni- the look of their genitalia, uh-huh. right? And they'd be like, oh, my genitalia doesn't look right. Let's just use that as an example. Or size, whatever you want to imagine with genitalia. And the irony is the partner is not thinking about that while they're pleasing that person by, t- by being attentive to that genitalia. Yeah, yeah. They're not doing an inspection on the genitalia. <laughs> That's not what they're doing. <laughs> well, what's amazing is the person it's, whose body, who's nervous, can be thinking they are. Now they're not present. Right. So if you have these conversations, it's just a way to like release that fear and be yes. present. Wow, Mike, this is challenging. I think that the listener, like if you're listening to this, I mean, this is challenging you to go home. And if you're in a relationship like this, talk to your partner about some of these fears. Yeah, absolutely. Because here's the thing. What are the odds that I'm going to be able to f- safely feel I can declare my boundaries, wants, desires, and don't wants? If I don't think I can be totally open with you, my sexual partner, Mm, mm -hmm. even if I've been with you 20 years, if I think, well, I can't express that with them, Mm -hmm. that means there's something being held back in our relationship. I'm not able to freely express, and you might not be able to freely express, and now we have a barrier up in our sexual relationship. That could be a barrier that stops us from truly discovering what, either, what, either, what the other person and myself wants or doesn't want. That's at the heart of consent. The heart of consent is finding what you mutually want to do with each other. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're never able to explore that, honestly, then what it is is I, we're just doing what pleases my other partner versus exploring what we both want with each other. Uh, so. You're not saying that these are not going to be uncomfortable conversations. That it's quite possibly this might be a, like an awkward and strange, uncomfortable conversation. But to kind of break down sort of that barrier of fear, you know, we have to kind of take this brave step of saying, "Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? This is what I want." And to have these conversations, even though we may feel awkward because society tells it to, tells us so. That awkwardness is not. I can't have this conversation. That's just awkwardness. Yeah, it is. And well, here's the neat thing: is the freedom the awkwardness brings you. Mm-hmm. So if you are able to have this conversation and it seems a little awkward, but then you're able to have it, the next time you two are intimate. What's happening? You're like, oh, I can't wait now, right? I can let go of this. I can be (laughs) free of this. And that is wonderful. That is beautiful. And by the way, some people might be sitting there going, do I, some of these things, do I really need to do with my partner? Couldn't I just do them for myself? Yes, yes, Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Like you may just need to have this conversation with yourself. I need to let that go because my partner doesn't care about it. They've never complained. They've never, I don't even need to have this conversation with my partner. But some of you people listening will realize that if I do have it with my partner to hear them say, why would that bother me? I would just like to hear that. It would just feel good. All right, then tell them, I would love to hear you say, like for me, it would be a big deal to know that doesn't, that's not what you're thinking about. And they're like, no, I wouldn't, that doesn't phase me at all. Or I don't want you to bring that up. Like that would be, that's going to turn me off, right? I, I don't want that being brought up. That turns me off. And that is a really cool sexual communication part. You can say things that you think are compliments that can turn your partner off. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you say to somebody, you say to somebody, well, you have such a big blank, Uh right? And they think it ain't big, so don't lie to me. Now now I feel like you're just lying to me. Uh I'd rather have you say it's this blank, but don't say big if it's not big. Now that could be any, that's not just genitalia. That could be other parts too they're referring to. Um, Or I don't like that it's big. (laughs) Uh, So stop telling me that it's big, right? But if you talked, you'd realize they don't like that word, but they love hearing you say, I love this about that same exact body part. So it's learning each other, what you want, don't want. In In language, not just sexual action. I, I've I've had some conversations about body parts with my partner, and I have to say it did help me release 
that worry that I had. So I'm just going to, you know, that's, 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 I will attest to the truth of this. And actually, Mike, I've thought about you and and I want to go to like talking to kids about dating and things like that. But I thought of you two times since that talk, because I, I remembered my husband reminded me of the sort of the story of when we were dating and we, we had gone to this party and then we hung out. And then the next night he invited me to a, a movie and he dropped me off. And on the doorstep of dropping me off at my apartment, I said to him, okay, you can kiss me now. <laughs> I'm just out of the blue because we were standing there and I wanted him to know. I was kind of like, okay, when is it coming? Come on, let's. And he, we laugh at that now. And it's really kind of a fun story. In our, but, but I was like, oh, kind of looking back at it through the lens of seeing your talk, I was like, oh, that was consent. It was like, Telling him consent. And then uh, the other story I thought of was- well, Hold on, I want to pause on that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's pause. Okay, yeah. Let's imagine that you had been given the skill set to ask. And it's saying, instead of saying, oh, you can kiss me right now, which is like giving you the okay, instead yeah. looked him right in the eyes and said, I would love to kiss you right now. Can I kiss you? <laughs> he would have been like, oh my God, this rocks. She is assertive. She is telling me what she wants versus he, he heard, oh, I can kiss you now which is very different than I want you now, right? When you look some in the eyes and say, I would love to kiss you right now. Can I kiss you? That is a, you want me. I want you. This feels Mm -hmm. so good. And that's the difference in having the skill and nobody giving us a skill. Nobody giving this skill. Hey, why didn't you kiss me? Or you can kiss me now. Give me the skill. I'd love to kiss you. That allows me to use my voice in, in a way that's fun and own what I'm feeling. And so you would say to like sort of parents of younger kids or, or kids and younger adolescents or whatever, kids who are starting to date, that that is a, something that if they are wanting to kiss another person, that they should, they, should add, they should say, can I kiss you now, right? Absolutely. Here's the thing. So I was just, I speak to middle schools and high schools. So I get everything from 10-year-olds, you know, a potential fifth grader, mm-hmm. 11 years old, all the way up to 18-year-olds. And let's be clear on a couple things parents need to think about it there. You should not be teaching middle schoolers that it is a green light to be experimenting with sexual intimacy in middle school. It's illegal. You're literally setting your kids up for sex crime violations in almost every state in this country. Wow. In middle school ages. There are some exceptions, but in most states, that is illegal. So you want to be very, very careful of that. So what we're talking about is when they are ready to be sexually intimate and able to give consent. You ask middle schoolers or high schoolers the following question. If you are incapable of talking to your partner about what you want to do with each other's body sexually and intimately, should you be engaging in the behavior? Almost every to a T child says, well, of course not. So when were you taught how to ask? Never. Never. So I've been taught, don't ask, but I just know common sense by what Mike asked me. If I can't talk about it, I shouldn't do it. That's common sense. Mm. But nobody taught me how to do that. So I just use the same system over and over again that's messed up. Make my move until you stop me. Make my move until you stop me. Which if I keep saying that over and over again, anyone listening is going to sound, you say, you sound like a predator. Make my move until you stop me. Make my move until you stop me. Make my move until you stop me. Sounds so predatorial. And most people call that their relationships. Yeah, my partner makes their move until I stop them. Yeah, that's the norm. I mean, when you, when you lay it out like that, it really hits home how, how you know, sort of dangerous and messed up that is. But it's, but it's so normal and taken for granted almost it everywhere is. that it's, it is. Oh, yeah. I was with fifth through eighth graders in Montana recently at a Catholic middle school, right? Because I love saying that because people be like, what were you doing in a Catholic middle school talking about intimacy, right? <laughs> it's abstinence only. And you don't realize that if you eat, whether you believe in abstinence or comprehensive sex ed, for anyone listening right now, if you think I'm only going to teach my kids abstinence only, or I'm only going to teach my kids comprehensive sex ed, which by the way, that would include abstinence. Comprehensive sex ed is the A to Z. Abstinence only is more focused on abstinence only. Regardless of what view you think you're going to take, 
teaching boundaries is critically important because if you believe in abstinence only, you want to teach them how to declare their boundaries so that nobody violates, so they can feel safe with their boundaries. And they, when they, somebody might try to violate their boundaries, they feel empowered to say, no, you don't have the right to do that. Consent teaches all of this. So mm-hmm. it's vital no matter where you're coming from. So it's really important for parents to realize that. Uh, so when you're talking about this with fifth through eighth graders and they recognize they're not at an age where they can consent yet, right? Mm-hmm. That also changes the conversation. Here's the question that parents will come up to me and say, and they'll push back on me. Look, my kid's dating someone in sixth grade. It's innocent, Mike. I don't see the problem with it. All right. I walk into the school, fifth through eighth grade kids. I say, parents tell me it's all innocent in middle school. Is it all innocent or they got it wrong? And whenever I've asked that question, in any middle school in this country, the students overwhelmingly say wrong. Mm. If we are dating somebody, it's because we are attracted to them in some sexual attraction way. Like we want to kiss them. We want to hold their hand, but we want physical intimacy. At least we think about it. It doesn't mean we want to do it yet. It doesn't mean we've thought about, but we want some intimacy in there. Now, by the way, I mean, we're not saying every kid. I don't want somebody to go, well, my kid, that doesn't fall. We're saying the majority of students say, I'm intrigued by that. All right. Yeah. Whether it's kissing or more. Now, what's amazing is every middle school also admits some kids are doing a whole lot more than kissing. Mm-hmm. A whole lot more that they are experimenting with because they don't know better. So, or they're looking online and seeing pornography and then they're trying to say, well, that looks normal. So I'll try to repeat that because that's the only norm I've seen. And they get these really unhealthy understandings of what they think is sexual intimacy that is mutual, that's wonderful, that's, that sounds incredible and it looks like it feels incredible. And it's a really messed up understanding. So one thing parents really want to think about is, look, Dating can be highly dangerous. It can also be one of the greatest experiences in life. It, you get to know yourself. You get to learn about others. And it can be joyful and wonderful. And it can be awful. We need to teach the, we need to teach the full spectrum. Mm. And if we do that, then kids see, oh, it can be wonderful, but that takes these things to happen right. If you do it this way, they're not as scared of dating, but they're also aware while dating. Right? And they're also aware of when they're ready and when they're not ready. So just because you find yourself attracted to Jordan over there doesn't mean you're ready to date. Because attraction is a normal, healthy thing that people have. It doesn't mean that I'm at a place in my life where I'm ready to date Jordan. Those are two very different discussions. And kids get that. I'll be like, look, how do you find out if you want to date Jordan? And they find out the same way we did. I have a friend find out. Huh, or... Yeah. Or we pass notes. <laughs> now, the difference today is uh, we text, right? They'll do that. Yeah. They'll add that. But the notes is still popular. The going through friends is still popular. And I'll say, why are you doing these other sources? Because I'm not ready to talk to them. I'm not comfortable with that. And you want to date them? So, oh if, my God, you're still you, bringing me back. <laughs> <laughs> right. We all, th- I did it. I absolutely did it at those ages. I thought, oh, I want to date them and I want to, but I could never talk to them. I, I'm not ready. I think in fifth grade, I was like, quote unquote, going out with Nick McGinn, who talked to me through his cousin, you know, and he right. like, I don't know, like we went to a baseball game with his father. Anyway, you know, it was like, but yeah, if someone had explained to me, attraction doesn't mean you're ready to date and had said those words explicitly to me, I would have understood that. Right? Yes, right. Because when you say it like that, it's common sense, right? And that's why yeah. kids get it. Like, oh, yeah. Like, you could be attracted to somebody in first grade. Does that mean you should be dating them? And they're like, well, of course not. Okay, so there's a big difference. Now, how do you know when you're ready to date? Oh, this is a conversation they're almost never asked. Yeah. How do you know when you're ready to date? And that's a powerful discussion. Hmm. How do you know when you're ready to date? Oh my gosh. I'm like kind of like the way you talk about, it, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to talk to my daughters about this question. But yeah, I guess how, I don't know. I mean, um, well, let's start with the one question that's important. What's the age of consent in my state? Hmm. Because if you're letting them date before they can consent to sexual intimacy uh-huh. and you just found out that middle schoolers believe 
that once they start dating, they're at least intrigued with sexual intimacy, at Uh least intrigued to think your kid's going to date and have none of that intrigue grow (laughs) or Uh become even deeper is probably not realistic. So ideally, you don't want kids dating before they are able to say yes to sexual contact. Now, I'm not saying say yes to sex, but say yes to sexual contact because a lot of different things can add up to sexual contact. So we want to be clear that we don't want to put them in a legally dangerous or liable situation, especially with sex. That's not something we want to be doing nowadays. I mean, we never should have been doing it, but we're aware of it nowadays. That's a difference. So is my kid legally able to consent? If they're not, all right, let's teach them how to grow amazing friendships, spend time with that person they're attracted to, and get to know them better as a human being and build an amazing friendship so that when you are legally old enough, you can pursue that if you still want. Mm. Right? And they're like, well, you can't expect them to control themselves. Okay, time out, mom and dad. You just said your kid can't control themselves. And you now want them to date the person they can't control themselves around. (laughs) So we we have to pause and go, wait, if they can't control themselves, maybe that's one of the signs they're not ready. Yeah. yeah. If, and one question I'll ask students, and we have this in Catechism, the book, we have this as an exercise, which is ask somebody their standards. Like, what's your standards on a first date? They'll be like, oh, I don't kiss on the first date. All right. What if they were, like, you were totally hot for them? And it was just going amazing. Okay, maybe, maybe I'd kiss them then. Oh, all right. What if while you're kissing them, it's just hot, heavy, and amazing. It feels so good and you feel so safe. And they now want to move their hands somewhere. And, and you just, oh, it feels incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we're not going to go all the way. But yeah, oh, see, what's happening is their standards are quickly changing based on real possible triggers and feedback they're getting. Mm-hmm. What most parents make the mistake of thinking is, oh, on a first date, what's your standard? The kid says, oh, I won't kiss on the first date. And the parent just goes, oh, awesome. See, that's a good boundary to have. Conversation done. (laughs) Done. And they don't recognize the kid is playing out the safe answer in their mind. They're picturing the safer situation Mm -hmm. where I'm not sexually just feel like I just need this person right now. I don't feel that lust. So, of course, I'm going to say, and I'm being honest, I'm not lying to my parents. I'm not going to kiss on the first date. But then when reality hits and this deep sexual attraction is occurring, oh, I wasn't giving my answer based on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not getting to the heart of what a standard is. A standard would apply in the greatest situation possible and the worst case situation possible, a true standard. The, The sad thing is that kids and adults often create their standards based on what they think their parents want to hear. Yeah. So it's not their standards. It's their parents' standards. I'd rather a kid be fully honest with me and say, wow, if it was amazing, I'd do blank, 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 blank on a first date. Because that, now you're being honest with me. All right. I'd rather you say that than say, oh, I would never do nothing, maybe kiss on a first date when you know that's not true. Like I'd, the more honest you can be with me, the more I can say, all right, have you learned about all of that? Yeah. What does it take for that to feel good for your partner? What about for you? How are you going to know if your partner's not in the mood for that or you're doing it and they don't like it? How are you going to know all of this? So they said yes, but it's not comfortable. Uh, How are you going to feel comfortable stopping something? Because you started it, you said yes, you wanted it. Maybe you even pursued it. And 30 seconds in, you're not liking it. How are you going to be able to say, whoa, 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 this just isn't working? So even though I know I'm the one who asked for it, this isn't working and not feel guilty because you have the right to stop it at any time. How are you going to, what's the language you're going to use in those moments, right? This is at the heart of everything. And these are conversations very few parents are having. Oh, yeah. I can imagine that barely any parents are having. (laughs) Right. (laughs) There are. What's amazing is the ones who are having these conversations, Uh those kids have so much more of a toolbox loaded with confidence and understanding. Like I meet them. I meet the college students up to me and goes, man, the conversations my mom had were priceless, so detailed and graphic sometimes. But it armed me. It gave me the tools to be so much more equipped than my friends are right now. And that's just it. I've never met the kid who said, well, my parents were graphic. They were this, but they were appropriate. 
and it's done me harm. I've never met the kid who said that. It's always, they were appropriate, but they also gave me what I needed to hear. And I'm so grateful for that. That's all you hear. That that doesn't mean at the time the kid was grateful. Mm -hmm. It means that as the kid has developed, they are grateful that they were treated with that maturity. So as our kids are sort of starting to get old enough to date, we need to be asking them, you know, about what dating should look like for them. How, how would they like it to feel? Like, what are the ages of consent? And then if you ask them some of these questions, like, how do you know, you know, what might you do? What are those standards you might do on the first date? We should be pushing, pushing back a little bit on those standards and say, well, what if, blah, blah, blah. So this, this all implies like a level of connection and comfort level. That, well, that, it, yeah, it takes patience. So the the worst thing you can do as a parent, and I fall into this category, and I did this at times, is you get all this new information, and you think you have to run home now and blitz your kid with all the information. Now, strangely, your kid has lived 13 years, 60 days, and five hours without that information, and you think now that if they live one more hour without it, their life will not be the same. And so you have to just vomit this all over them instantly. And they're not engaged, they're not listening, and this is a waste of time for everyone, except you think you're doing good, and it's not doing good. So what we have to think of as parents is, where do I start this, Mm. right? And little pieces at a time. Don't go into a two-hour conversation. Don't go into a one-hour conversation, for heaven's sakes. A five-minute, and then a 10-minute, and then a 15-minute, right? Let these be naturally, even though they can be awkward, let them feel natural, and let them progress where they belong. So the, maybe, the mistake we can make is, oh, they're going on a date tonight. Now I have to overload them with all this information. Yeah, yeah, we don't want that. So maybe just even going home, I listened to this podcast today and, you know, this guy was talking about how- I'm going to pause you know, right kids. there. The moment you say to a kid, I was listening to this podcast today, <laughs> they already know, oh God, oh no. oh no, what the heck have you been listening to? So I don't even want to do that. Yeah. I want to connect with them in a very authentic way without making it about me, but showing how we relate. Let me give you an example. Here's a bad example. Bad example is when I, wow, times have changed so much since I was your age. I can't even imagine what you're going through. So let's talk about that. That's horrific. Here's why. The kid is listening going, yeah, you have no clue what I'm going through. You just admitted it. So why am I listening to you? So that's a really bad example. Really good example is, Hey, when I was your age, I knew a lot of people that were confused, that were experimenting, that had thoughts, that had questions, that were dating, and it led to all these questions, such as, and you give one, Hmm. have you ever felt that way? Hmm. Now, that is more sincere. That is more natural. Now, notice I didn't do this either. When I was your age, I had all these thoughts. I, 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 do Hmm. you. Now that's also bad because it's all about you're living through me and you can't make the mistakes I made and that's the impression or you can make the mistakes I made and the kid feels like you're being way too open and then with your personal life yeah. and it's their life not your not yours that they're living mm-hmm. and so you can actually do harm with that because I know parents will go I share everything I ever did why there's a difference in personal and private. There's a big difference in personal and private. Personal things you can share. Private things should be private, right? And so why are you doing that? Well, it helps them know I made mistakes. You could have just said I made mistakes. Like you you didn't need to tell them the mistake because here's what a kid hears when you say, look, I made those same mistakes and I don't want you to make them. The kid goes, well, I'm here. So how bad were your mistakes? Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been that bad. And they see you now green lighting them to make all the same mistakes because clearly life's not that bad, right? It's the same thing we all did. Let's say you lived in a home where it was abstinence only and your parents said not till marriage. And the kid thought, what, did you wait till marriage? You know, most every kid who's taught that does think that because if you talk with kids, they just tell you that. I've wondered, did my parents actually wait till marriage? Because if they didn't, why am I listening to them? Yeah. Right. And so they're looking for validation to make the same, in your words, mistakes, not your words, but those parents' words, mistakes. And you don't want to be giving them that validation. All right. Instead, you want to say, look, we're all going to have days where we don't follow our standards. We're all going to have days where we believe we made bad choices or we made mistakes. That's human. So I want to give you as many skill sets as possible to help you make the best choices possible, knowing you're not always going to make the right one because none of us do. 
but I don't need to tell you all the personal mistakes I made for that to happen. Oh my God, I'm so glad you shared all that. That's really, really so, so helpful, Mike. Um, this this is amazing, everything you share. I do want to share the other time I thought about you is I already recently read Michelle Obama's biography, Becoming. And did you, I don't know if you read it. But I have not read it, but people are like dinging me up going, yes. Mike, he asked, can yes. I kiss you? Like literally the title of your book. <laughs> and what's cool about that is I've been teaching this for about as long as they've been together. So uh, yeah, there was no way that could have been planned, obviously. But yeah, I mean, we were thrilled to see that when people have told me, I've had people take a picture of the page yes. of the book. And send it to me as, look what he did. He asked, can I kiss you? So, oh, which obviously you can imagine, we love. Another great reason to love Barack Obama from my <laughs> camp. Uh, this, Mike, this has been so incredibly helpful. I feel like the when you you share this in such a down to earth real way, you know, where you you have this experience talking to kids. You know, you have this experience, and and the way you present this, it just I feel like every time I hear you talking about it, I am just, it pushes back against the parts of me that wants to say, stay comfortable and, and not have those conversations and, and say, yes, this is so, so important. And there are skillful ways to have these conversations. And this is vital uh, for, for all of us, for, for not only my kids, but for the generation of kids that are coming. So I, this thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I, we used to tell parents, and I still do when I'm doing live sessions with parents at schools and communities, the, the conversation you most fear having with your child is probably the one you most need to have. Yeah. It's just how you choose to have it. Now, there's, that's everything. How you have these conversations is what ends up mattering. Not just that you have them, how. Am I coming with love, compassion, or am I lecturing? Am I leading with fear or love and compassion? There's a big difference there. Yeah. Yeah. So these questions, I assume, are, uh, are in, um, can I kiss you? Yes. Uh, not everything we've discussed is, yeah, but yeah, a lot yeah. of, yeah, absolutely. A lot of this okay. is in, can I kiss you? We also have a DVD for parents called Help My, My Teen is Dating. And there's a <laughs> lot of this in there too. We have our own podcast called The Respect Podcast, which they can join also and listen to weekly. Now that's not just parents, that's business. We talk about respecting business and schools, all different elements of that. But so there's all these avenues. The one thing we do have, Hunter, is which we'll provide for all of your listeners, is we have a monthly webinar. Parents can jump on. And right now, we're doing it for free. Normally, it's like $200 a year for somebody to join that every month. Mm -hmm. But we're doing it for free. And that's raisesaferkids.com. When you go there and you scroll down, you'll actually see that we have a free option for it right now. And they can, they can use that free option until we, we cut that off. So right now, though, it is still available. Okay. Hopefully that will still be available when this podcast goes live. Yes. Um, and so people can find you at raisesaferkids.com. And where yeah, the, they find the best you? place to find me at is going to be, uh, we, we actually are about to change the name of our organization. So depending on when this comes out, uh, the Date Safe Project, is, you might see it under a different name. But if you go to datesafeproject.org, mm -hmm. it'll definitely, even if we change our name, it'll take you there. So datesafeproject.org. The way we say it is you want to Go on a date, you want to feel safe, and you don't want to feel like it's a project. Date safe project. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate the work you do. I really feel like uh, you are a, living your dharma, right? You're calling to, to do sacred work in this world. And, and your work has rippled out into my life and, and th so many countless others and is really making a huge impact. So I, I, just want to thank you. I, I really, really appreciate it and appreciate you coming and sharing it with us. Well, I appreciate you, Hunter, and making this happen and providing this opportunity. I consider myself, the word I use is like a portal. I think we all are. And so we gain insights from the work we do. And I, I'm blessed to be in a grateful, I should say, to be in an area that I love the work I do. And I just get to share it outward. And I love that. And you provided that opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, right? Wow, wow, wow. Mike just opens your eyes. <laughs> it uh, really makes you think. I, I mean, I challenge you. Like, are you going to be talking about this episode after this? I mean, I know I 
was talking about my conversation with Mike for a long time to many people. So I hope that you will. And I hope you'll share this because this stuff that we need to share, right? We need to start to shift things and we can do that. We can change patterns of generations of kind of stuffing things down and not talking about things and keeping things in the dark where they're scary. And instead, we can bring them into the light. We have the power. We can step up to that responsibility. We can do it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can do it. (sighs) All right. So just a reminder, we I'll be doing my Unmartyr Yourself Challenge coming up on May 6th through 9th. You can join that at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. And it is for you if you have challenged putting your needs last. That is a lot of us, I know. So I hope you will check that out, mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. It's kind of a crazy word to spell. I'll spell it for you. It's slash U-N, unmartyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, unmartyr. Although I'll put something up on the events page of the website. So if you just want to go to mindfulmamamentor.com, you can find it there too. That'll make it a little easier for you. Yeah, yeah. So I hope you'll join me. And it'll give you some training in how to have some difficult conversations. And you're going to get my really powerful self-care assessment right away when you join, which is so worth it. it it's going to really open your eyes to what is the real truth of what's going on in your life in that er- those areas. So like the areas of personal self-care, social relationship, self-care, creativity, spirituality, all kinds of things. So you can get that assessment as soon as you sign up at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. Okay. I am wishing you a beautiful week, my friend. I hope you will, uh, join us and talk about this conversation and share the word and uh, yeah I wish you some peace and ease but I also wish you some difficult conversations in your future me too (laughs) I'll be right there with you all right take care namaste